This episode is brought to you by Morty, Buzzshot, Cogs, and Patreon supporters like you. Cogs by Clockwork Dog is an easy to use platform for running interactive events, specializing in escape rooms. They have plug and play hardware that seamlessly integrates with their software, so you can create a show with lighting and sound cues, all without having to write a single line of code. Map different kinds of inputs and outputs by building up simple logic steps, which determine what you want to happen and when. Their newest product, COGS5, will allow Zigbee connections, powering smart bulbs, buttons, and switches, as well as MIDI keyboards. It'll give you remote connectivity over LAN or the internet. And now they're also integrating with BuzzShot, our other sponsor, letting you integrate the player's info into the game or automatically updating leaderboards. The COG starter set is normally valued at $257, but our listeners can get the starter set today for only $130 with free shipping to the US. You can learn more and purchase your COGS starter set at COGS.show. Use code REPOD at checkout. That's R E P O D. Link and details in the show notes. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guest is Eric Berlin, a puzzle maker and author who has designed dozens of crossword puzzles for the New York Times, among other outlets, written the puzzling world of Winston Breen trilogy, blending narrative fiction with puzzles, led the construction of MIT Mystery Hunts, and has two new installments in his Puzzle Snacks book series of bite-sized puzzles, Carnival and Bonanza, which are out now. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited. I'm such an Eric Berlin fangirl. <laughs> you don't know this, Eric, but Puzzle Snacks probably comes up in our Patreon Discord at least once a month. I feel like it comes up quite often when people are like, you know, I'm looking for a gift. I'm looking for a puzzle book for what I'm traveling. Any suggestions? Puzzle Snacks always is like the number one recommendation when it comes to puzzle books. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I always wonder where people are coming from. I get an order in. I'm like, how did this person find me? It's probably all coming from you. We're definitely preaching the gospel of puzzle snacks. That's wonderful. Thank you. I have to tell you, when I was researching for this episode, it hadn't occurred to me over the years the incredible number of times that we have written about your work in some capacity on Room Escape Artist. I don't think that we have written about someone's work as much as yours, especially for someone who has not really made an escape room before, although you've made a crossword escape room, which we'll be talking about shortly. Oh, yeah. I forgot about the crossword escape room. Yes, of course, that's going to come up. Right. Yes. <laughs> On the topic of us recommending things for people to buy for themselves and also for their loved ones who enjoy puzzles, this week, the Room Escape Artist Holiday Gift Guide is out, and you can find Eric's new Puzzle Snacks books in the guide. You should absolutely check out the guide. We've been making it for years. It's something that we put a lot of love into, and the past guides are always linked because they hold up as well. The holiday gift guides are great. I am a catalog fan. I miss Sky Mall. You know, I, I loved Brookstone. <laughs> I like weird, innovative gifts. And I feel like David put so much time and effort into finding some really different and unique items for the gift guide. So I'm a fan of that as well. <laughs> with that plug out of the way, let's start with crossword puzzles, Eric, because Looking at your career, it feels to me like the crossword puzzle is at the heart of so much of what you do. How did you find your way into that world? I found my way into that world by getting fired from my job at the height of the dot-com boom. <sighs> I was working for an online games company as a games designer, and I got laid off, and I didn't really know what to do with myself. Something that had been percolating in the back of my mind was to make and sell one puzzle to the New York Times, just to say that I did it. This was in, in the year 
2000 or so. So the whole thing of online word finders was in its infancy if it existed at all. So instead, I had a reference book about a foot thick, full of words that you could look up. I need a word where the fifth letter is J and it's five letters. And you flip, flip, flip through the pages and you go down there and you find the words that might fit into your puzzle. And I did also have kind of a pocket calculator thing called a Franklin word finder that you methodically typed in. I had that too. It was like my favorite gadget as a kid. I used to stay up in the middle of the night with a flashlight because it didn't have a backlight. And I would look up words because that is the kind of nerd that I was and am. I loved my word finder. I wish I still had it, even though I would never use it for anything serious anymore. But I, I don't know where it is. I found one as a prop in an escape room a few years back. No. And I lost my mind. I wish that I had one, but I don't. But I did see one, and I do have a photo of it somewhere on Room Escape Artist. Please tell me it was integrated to a puzzle. It was not. It was just in the room. Oh, man. I don't think it worked anymore. If it did, I, I might have tried to buy it because it wasn't really being used. Wow, that's amazing. So anyway, with the Franklin Word Finder and with this insane reference book, I sat with a pad of graph paper and tried to make this puzzle. And it just, it took me a summer. I had no idea what I was doing. I found it a few weeks ago. I actually still have the pad of graph paper that I made it on, but eventually I was able to complete it. And I showed it to the crossword constructor, Frank Longo, who I was acquaintances with then. I haven't spoken to him in a long time, but I showed it to him and he sent it back within 90 minutes with my theme intact and most of my fill intact, but improved 100%. I'm like, oh my God. And he just did that, like, boom. He just, because he knows what he's doing. What kind of improvements did he make? He added a whole other theme entry. <laughs> and he took out a lot of the crap. Just the fill could have been improved. And he did it wherever that was possible. So when you say fill, what do you mean by that? Oh, I'm sorry. A typical daily New York Times crosser puzzle has a theme, and that theme is reflected in its various theme entries, often spanning across the entire grid. The black squares that you put into the grid then break it up so that you can get the rest of the words in there. The rest of the words are the fill. Okay, that aren't associated with the theme, but they're still like the clues, they're still the answers that you're filling in. You start filling in those words, and uh, slowly you get letters in the theme entries, and then you break open the theme entries and understand the theme from there. Because sometimes the themes are like puns, or they're not something that's immediately obvious, right? Right. Uh, so this theme for this puzzle, there were words scattered all around the grid, supposedly as fill, but they were actually theme words. They were all words that if you put the word man at the end of it, you would get an actor's name. So Gary Oldman, John Goodman, a whole bunch of man names. And then the actual theme entries, the long entries going across, explained what was going on. So Frank Longo added another man name that I didn't even attempt to squeeze in. I had nine in there, and he put in a tenth, and possibly even an eleventh, who even knows. And so he improved the grid and Will bought that puzzle. Will being Will Shorts, the puzzle editor of the New York Times. Just, just casually on first name basis with Will Shorts. <laughs> I've known Will Shorts for a long time. The reason that I went down this path at all to being a puzzle maker, I was a fanatic for Games Magazine once upon a time. I remember seeing it for the first time. We were picking up my father at an airport. He was coming home from a business trip, and it was on a magazine stand there, a magazine called Games, with this big, colorful puzzle on the cover. And I just completely fell in love. And uh, 10 years later, Games had gone out of business and then come back again with a greatly reduced masthead. I had just graduated college, and I thought, I am going to call them up and ask if I could write for them. Here is another area where I did not really know what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a freelance writer is not supposed to do that. But I called them up and I spoke to their senior editor, who was a man named Bert Hochberg. And he asked if I had any clips. 
And I said, no, but I'll give you a clip anyway. And I went home that night and I wrote a review of the video game I happened to be playing and I sent it to him. But he didn't give me an assignment. Instead, he invited me to the offices of Games Magazine on a Tuesday night. That is when they played all the new board games and decided what would be reviewed for the magazine and what would get tossed to the side. And he was letting me come and play games with them. Wow, you brazened your way into a games magazine game night. That's incredible. I could not believe this invitation. And my goal for that night was simply to be invited back again. That's all (laughs) I wanted to accomplish. And it worked because I kept going back for like 10 years. And that first night, I met Will Shorts, I met Mike Shank, and Bert Hochberg, and Peter Gordon, and and a whole bunch of other people who've become luminaries in the puzzle world. If they weren't already then, Mike Shank already was a luminary. He's now the editor of the Wall Street Journal crossword. It was a fantastic night. It was a memorable night. And and as I say, I, I just kept going back for 10 years. Some distant time into my tenure there, I started trying to make puzzles. And then my first puzzles appeared in Games Magazine or in Games World of Puzzles. That's incredible. Digging deeper into theme, on November 11th, 2018, the New York Times published your Escape Room crossword puzzle. This may have actually been the first New York Times crossword that I ever solved. (laughs) Can you explain how this puzzle worked? Yeah. So, a Sunday puzzle. This was a Sunday puzzle. Oh, I know. I needed a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> it's much larger than a daily. Uh, so there's a lot going on in there. When I approach a Sunday puzzle as a constructor, I tend to think in terms of metaphor. What can I make this puzzle pretend to be? I did a puzzle that was a masquerade party. I did a puzzle that was a magic show. And this puzzle was an escape room. The description you had in this is, this crossword represents an escape room with four articles you'll need hidden inside. After you complete the grid, follow the directions at 41, 70, and 99 across to find what to do next. Working correctly will lead you to a four word phrase with a total of 12 letters. That is your answer. Ah, yes, yes, yes. The long theme entries told you that you need the letters on the keys, place them into the corners, and then read the new words that we're reading down. So you are out now. (laughs) So in the uh, one down in this puzzle was Lou, like Lou Pinella, or who's a famous Lou. (laughs) L-O-U. And one of the letters on the keys was the letter Y. So you had to figure out, okay, that's going to go there and spell the word U. And then you did that for all the words in the corners, and you've got the final message, you are out now. And the New York Times made that into a contest, which was really neat. Yeah. If memory serves, it had over 20,000 submissions, and I think broke New York Times crossword contest records. Yeah, that's what it says right here on the uh, the article about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a lot of fun. That's incredible. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I mean, and this published in 2018, which I think was really the height of the whole craze of escape rooms. They really had started to go mainstream at that point. It was the height of that initial wave of escape rooms, for sure. That would probably be when that wave was cresting, really. And I had done a lot of escape rooms myself at that point, and I definitely wanted to figure out how to integrate an escape room into a crossword puzzle. I sweat a lot of sweat trying to come up with how the hell this was supposed to work. I was very pleased with how it came out. That's very clever. Yeah, it was really clever. It was very fun for the escape room community. I remember at the time, we as a community felt very seen by this because especially back then, other branches of the puzzle world would either participate and then ignore us or just ignore us outright. So it definitely felt like a special moment. Well, I'm very glad. I find crossword puzzles with a twist really interesting, like what you did in the Escape Room crossword and what you see in so many Sunday New York Times crossword puzzles. They feel difficult to pull off. Do you have any rules or techniques for determining what construction challenges are worth pursuing? As I said before, when I am doing a tricky 
Sunday puzzle. It's probably going to be a metaphor for something else. And if it doesn't communicate that metaphor well, I'm probably not going to go forward with it. I'm dying to do a puzzle about a surprise party. And maybe at the end, you figure out who the puzzle is for, who's the guest at the surprise party. And it's all kind of a cloud of mosquitoes right now. And it's been that way for months as I try to figure out what I want this to be. But I don't, I don't have it. I've come up with some ideas that don't work, maybe if I finesse them more. So this puzzle is just sitting way, way, way on the back burner waiting to become something good. I feel like a murder mystery would be fun. A murder mystery? That has been done. Andrew Chaikin did one a couple of years ago. It was very nice. And there have been murder mystery crosswords here and there in various locations because that marriage just fits so well. I completely agree. Uh, but the New York Times ran one a couple of years ago. This is blowing my mind. I do the occasional crossword, not really the New York Times ones. And I know there's themes, but I didn't know it ever really took the format of anything besides these answers all follow a theme. I didn't realize there was another type of puzzle hidden within a puzzle. Oh, that's a, a whole thing now, actually. I'm not very good at it, and I don't tend to do these puzzles, but I'm aware of them. They are called meta crosswords. The Wall Street Journal, I believe, runs one every Friday, put together by uh, great constructors like Patrick Berry and Mike Shank, I think. And then Matt Gaffney, the constructor Matt Gaffney, he's been doing this for ages for his subscribers, where he sends out a puzzle. It looks like a standard crossword, 15 by 15, 17 by 17, but always there is some thing happening in there. And after you fill in the grid, you've got to wade in there and say, where is the puzzle in here? It's not always spelled out for you the way I did it in my escape room. Take these letters, move them into the corners. A lot of meta crosswords are just like, here's your filled in grid. Good luck. And I'm terrible at that. I just I can't separate the signal from the noise. The signal's in there somewhere, but I can't find it. I need instructions with my puzzles. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing escape rooms, haunts, and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its fantastic website experience, iPhone app, and its brand new Android app, available now on the Google Play Store. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. PG, I learned an interesting thing about Morty statistics the other day. Apparently, escape room companies that have listed their time slots on Morty get 25% more page views than companies that don't. That's crazy. <laughs> it's not a shocker to me because I'm much more likely to book if I can just at a glance, check out the room on Morty, see what time slots are available. And if it's in a time slot that I want to play, I'm going to click through to book. I guess that makes sense to me. I just never do the booking. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> you can learn more at morty.app slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details in the show notes. So, Eric, I loved your story about how you brazened your way into Games Magazine. But if somebody is a new crossword constructor, they have similar ambitions of getting their work published in a major outlet. What should they know about the process? Is there a process in place where they can apply or submit? The first thing that a new crossword constructor should do is they should know that there are dozens, if not scores, of people already in the crossword community who will be happy to mentor you and point out the things you're doing right, point out the things you're doing wrong. This grid has way too many black squares. They will point the way. There are several communities full of people reaching for the next generation of crosswords. So I highly recommend that you seek those groups out and join them and take 
the advice that you get very seriously. And then after that, you just work at it. You get your tools. That first crossword I made with graph paper and ridiculous reference books that nobody needs anymore, that's not what you need now. You need software like Crossword Compiler or there's a half dozen other things. You need a word list. There are several excellent free ones out there that you just download and plug into your software or just program online. You get the tools of the trade. You get some good advice. You come up with some good themes. And you make a lot of mistakes and you learn to accept that maybe your first few puzzles are not going to get accepted anywhere. You persevere. That sounds very similar to like the escape room community, which is really surprisingly very welcoming to new creators. And they're always excited to hear that people have an interest in creating. That's good. Yeah, I love that. You just mentioned tools of the trade, word list. You mentioned crossword compiler. What are some of the other tools or things that you're using in your daily practice? That is pretty much it. I have not made a standard crossword in a long time. <laughs> I focus now on variety puzzles in puzzle snacks and other arenas. So crossword compiler almost always does not do it for me. Crossword compiler is there to make crosswords. It's there to thread words going across and going down. For the kind of things I need, I've got my iPad and I have various word finders online that I have learned how to program to produce the words that might help me fill whatever it is I'm working on. So let's shift now and talk about your more recent work in Puzzle Snacks. You released the first Puzzle Snacks book back in 2019 and it's a personal favorite of mine because I adore small, approachable, and above all, well-constructed puzzles. What drove you to make this in the first place? Puzzle Snacks began as a completely different enterprise called Puzzle Your Kids. I wanted to reach out to the next generation of puzzle lovers, and I wanted to give them good, solid puzzles, because there really are a lot of bad ones out there. And I wanted to be the one making the good ones. <laughs> and I had my subscribers. It works pretty much the way Puzzle Snacks does now. I had subscribers. I had a free puzzle online. I had a store where you can go and buy other things. And back then, when you subscribed, it asked you how old you were. If you were a parent or a teacher or a kid, and if you were a kid, it asked you how old you were. I was making some rash assumptions about my audience. Many times, somebody would say, well, I'm not a parent. I'm not a teacher. I guess I'm a kid. How old are you? I'm 43. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like a personal attack. <laughs> <laughs> and it began to dawn on me that I was not making puzzles for kids. I was making puzzles for everybody and kids were also invited, but my audience was older than I understood. And so I shifted gears and Puzzle You Kids became Puzzle Snacks. And I was able to widen the vocabulary that I use a little bit now that it wasn't 100% fourth grader friendly. And that's where Puzzle Snacks came from. That's brilliant. I love Puzzle Snacks. I have it here right next to me. <laughs> I play them when I'm watching TV because nowadays you got to multitask. You can't just do the one thing. It's impossible for me to watch a movie without having a puzzle in my hand. I don't know how people do it. <laughs> I don't know how all of you people are puzzling and watching things at the same time. I can't comprehend this. It's a snack, David. It's a puzzle snack. <laughs> I am a devoted unitasker. <laughs> You're a lost breed. <laughs> I know. For those of you at home who have never played these, can you tell us a little bit about the style of the puzzles in Puzzle Snacks? So, puzzle snacks are variety puzzles. Variety puzzles can take any of, let's just say, a hundred different forms. It's probably more than that. A crossword, everybody knows what a crossword is. The words go across, the words go down. When was the last time you saw a crossword that had instructions? They're just not necessary. Everybody knows what that is. But words can be weaved together in far more interesting ways than just across and down. 
there are spirals where it's literally a spiral shaped grid and the words are entered in the spiral starting at the beginning and winding its way all the way to the end. This is my favorite template that you use. I love a spiral. Because then when you start at the end and work your way back to the beginning again, the words transform from that first set of words to a completely different second set of words. It's really quite magical. I love it so much. It's elegant and it's mind blowing. It really feels like a magic trick. I completely agree. There's several variety puzzle types that are transformative. I invented one a couple of years ago called drop-ins, where it's a long list of words in the same way that a spiral starts off as a long list of words. But whereas a spiral transforms by reading backwards, in a drop-ins, that initial set of words transforms when you drop the same letter multiple times into the string and then re-space. And you can get some really magical transformations in this way. Before I realized that this is what you were doing in Puzzle Snacks, the first time we solved a puzzle like this, my immediate reaction was, oh, he's a witch. Burn him. (laughs) (laughs) I did not invent the spiral. The spiral has been around for a long time. It ran in games. I hadn't seen it before, and it blew my mind. Yeah, I I totally understand that. Uh, It it blew my mind the first time I saw it as well. It just doesn't seem possible for it to be that beautiful. I love crosswords. I solve crosswords every day. But variety puzzles strike me as beautiful in a way that crosswords don't really anymore to me. I I solve them. You have the theme. It's cute. I move on. But there's a beauty and elegance that isn't always there. For that, I want to turn to variety puzzles. A crossword puzzle is a grind. And for this, I think snacks works in a variety of ways because I love words. I'm a word nerd. But the variety part, it's like a buffet. You get so many different styles of puzzles. Exactly, yes. And it's very satisfying because you could finish one. I typically do one in, I would say, 10 minutes or less. Some Mm -hmm. are five minutes. Some can take up to 20. But generally speaking, they're pretty fast solved. So you get that instant hit of gratification. And then you turn the page and there's a completely other new thing there for you. Not the same one again. I like having a lot of variety in my variety puzzle. Buzzshot is escape room software powering business growth, player marketing, and improving the customer experience. They offer an assortment of pre- and post-game features, including robust waiver management, branded team photos, and streamlined review management for Yelp, TripAdvisor, Google Reviews, and Morty. Buzzshot now has integration with Repod sponsor Cogs for all of your technology needs. Maxime Fillion of Immersia has this to say about Buzzshot. World-class support for what I consider a world-class platform for any escape room business. Buzzshot provides industry-leading tools and amazing customer support. When you book a Buzzshot demo, you won't get a sales pitch. The team at Buzzshot genuinely wants to understand your business so that they can tailor their software to match your unique needs. Streamline your marketing and grow your escape room business. Repod listeners get an extended free trial and 20% off your first three months with no setup fees or hidden charges. Visit buzzshot.com slash repod, that's R-E-P-O-D, to learn more Link and details in the show notes. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your new books that are out, Carnival and Bonanza? Yeah, this was always my intention. I put out a puzzle or even two puzzles to my subscribers every Friday. And I've amassed hundreds of puzzles in my database. And it was always my intention to put them together into little collections and sell them. That first set came out with Simon & Schuster. They decided not to go for a volume two. Oh, well, I'm not without options. I simply put them together myself and I put them on Amazon and just print on demand. 
and boom, they're in your mailbox, and now you've got puzzles in your lap. You can also go to the Puzzle Snacks shop and download several other collections, but then you've got to print them out. I like having the bound book. I'm, I'm glad I went this way. These are collections of previous puzzles that had gone out to subscribers over the last few years. So it's basically a similar style to the original Puzzle Snacks. They're just new puzzles. No, they're specifically old puzzles. They're new to book buyers, old if they're your subscriber. If you are not a subscriber to Puzzle Snacks, you will not have seen them before. Right. But they are collections of the puzzles that I send out every week to my subscribers. On the back of both of these books, Room Escape artist writer Andrew Reynolds has a quote right below a quote from A.J. Jacobs, also a friend of the show. Andrew's quote is, if you like word puzzles and you're not familiar with the work of Eric Berlin, you're missing out. And I could not agree more. That was as flattering a quote as I could possibly have hoped for, and I was very glad to put it on the back cover. I think that Andrew is very excited that his quote is there. He's a huge word puzzler. We have a little leaderboard going for the New York Times Mini that a lot of us do every day on the team. And he regularly crushes us and does this thing in like <laughs> under 20 seconds. Oh, my Lord. Under 20 seconds. OK, you know what? My time is usually under a minute. I was feeling pretty good about that. <laughs> yeah. Andrew is a beast. Let's move on from puzzle snacks and crosswords. You've been captain of Palindrome, one of the largest and one of the more competitive MIT Mystery Hunt teams. For those who are unfamiliar, the Mystery Hunt is one of, if not the world's most challenging team puzzle competition. In 2021, Palindrome won the Mystery Hunt. So in 2022, the team was rewarded and punished with the honor and burden of creating the next hunt. In your hunt that year, you had a cameo from Weird Al Yankovic. I'm curious to hear what the story is there. Yes, it was my final year as captain. I wanted to oversee a mystery hunt, and by gum, I did it. And now I've passed the mantle on to uh, my friend Ben Smith and let him deal with it from now on. I'm so impressed. I don't even participate in MIT Mystery Hunt, and even I've heard of Palindrome. It's famous. Wow. Really? It was actually my first Mystery Hunt team. I was on Palindrome for one year. I think it was 2018, maybe 2017. Palindrome is a revolving door. We have our core puzzlers, and then we have the outer shell of electrons that come and go. We were in the, like the very distant shell of electrons, the, the, <laughs> the, the shell that gets shed sometimes. Rex Miller, oh sure, old friend of ours, he was on Palindrome at the time, and he was like, oh yeah, join in on Palindrome. It has a lot of remote players. And we didn't know anything about the Mystery Hunt other than the team that won had to make the next one, and then it was supposed to be really hard. And so the first year that we played, it was a Mystery Hunt that ended pretty quickly, Oh, was that Dungeons and Dragons? It was the Dungeons and Dragons one. Oh, no wonder I didn't know you were on Palindrome. That was the largest team Palindrome ever fielded. I woke up the next morning and learned that the hunt was over, that Palindrome was done, and that it had nearly won. And I was horrified that I was accidentally almost on a winning team because I did not want to be on a winning team. Well, the, the <laughs> team is required to make... The, the mystery hunt. No specific person is required to be a part of that. Oh, I, I know that I would not have been like press ganged into it, but I, I'm dying to hear about the Weird Al story. So the New York Times had, I think is the right verb at this point, a series of crosswords where they paired a celebrity with a uh, professional constructor. Neil Patrick Harris did one. The musician Emmanuel Axe did one. Isaac Mizrahi, the fashion designer, did one. Who else? Uh, Natasha Leone, if I'm pronouncing her name right. Poker face actress. She's a big crossworder. And she did one with my friend Deb Amlin. I love her. Oh, I love her too. Yeah, uh, she's great. And I was not invited to this party. In the same manner as Games Magazine, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I thought, who can I try to approach? How can I try to make this work? And I thought that Weird Al was a kind of a natural fit for this sort of thing. But nobody else had thought of him. Is he a puzzle fan? 
There is a documentary. You remember uh, Behind the Music, VH1 Behind the Music? Yes. That was a mini documentary series. Each episode was about a different band or, or musician. And there was a, a Behind the Music about Weird Al Yankovic. And it was just about an hour of how completely nice a person he is. Famously lovely. And he really is. There was a very fast shot during that documentary that I sat up straight when I saw it. It was him reading Games Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a fellow <laughs> word nerd. <laughs> Kindred souls. So I pitched the idea of approaching Al to Will Shorts. I worked with a friend of mine who was a celebrity journalist because I had no idea how to contact Weird Al Yankovic. And my friend was able to get in touch with his manager. And so I put Will Shorts in touch with his manager. The manager pitched it to Weird Al. Weird Al wrote back within half an hour saying, I'm completely in. Sounds great. And so I got to make a crossword with Weird Al Yankovic. And it was awesome. <laughs> I never got to meet him or even speak to him on the phone. We traded phone numbers. I'm like, oh my God, I'm trading phone numbers with Weird Al Yankovic. But I couldn't just call him randomly. I'm not, I'm not going to just... So our entire working relationship was by email. And the puzzle came out and it was fine. And uh, we all moved on with our lives. It was a fun experience. When we won the mystery hunt... One of the major puzzles in the hunt had to do with Weird Al Yankovic's music. And you had to discover that. And I'm spoiling things. So spoiler alert, belatedly. Like you're really going to go back and solve the 2022 mystery hunt. But anyway, one of the puzzles had to do with Weird Al Yankovic's music. And you had to uh, figure that out for yourself. And it had to do with cooking and all the foods that are mentioned in his songs. And then once you have that aha, you do some matching up and you arrive at your answer. And after you solve these major puzzles, they're, they're, they're the meta puzzles. For those who don't know, in a hunt of this nature, you solve a bunch of smaller puzzles. And by smaller, I mean, they can take a couple hours in their own right. And those answers all feed into a larger meta puzzle. And that meta puzzle takes all the answers and you've got to figure out what to do with them. And then you arrive at the answer for that round. And it's a big deal when you're able to do it. And in this case, after you solve a meta puzzle, you are shown a video of somebody basically congratulating you. And I thought, man, I wonder if Weird Al will make that video for us. And I spent an hour easily crafting my pitch to him. And I sent it off to him, and literally within two minutes, he wrote back saying, sure, I'll do that. Nowadays, you can just buy him off a of Cameo. <laughs> I, I could I don't know if he does Cameo. Cameo, we almost did a Cameo-based puzzle with a bunch of celebrities, but ultimately we did not. But anyway, one of the highlights of making the hunt for me was that I got to write a comedy bit for Weird Al Yankovic to perform, because I wrote the script that he acted out. And he did a wonderful job recording the video and acting like this bananas chef who makes these wacky inventions. The calculated whisk, right? The calculated whisk. That was the answer to that round. And he was going to give you a calculated whisk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so cute. Every answer in the hunt, every meta answer, was a pun. My favorite one in the hunt, for example, for our fantasy round, every round had to do with a different genre of books. Weird Owls was cookbooks, and then we had a fantasy round, and the answer to the fantasy round was Narnia beeswax. <laughs> So anyway, calculated whisk was the answer to the, the cookbooks round. And when whoever dropped that suggestion, we all went, oh, ha, 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 that's a good one. And we made that the answer, not knowing that nine months later, we were going to have to actually fashion a calculated whisk and send it off to Weird Al Yankovic for him to use as a prop. And we had some engineers on the team and they worked hard to attach a hot pink pocket calculator to a kitchen whisk with welding irons and I don't even know what else. And they sent it to me and I sent it to Al and, and the rest is history. The video is online. We will put it in the show notes. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's a good looking uh, whisk. I'm glad that you, you got your finest minds on it. Oh, yeah. In your many years running a top mystery hunt team, what are some of the things that you've learned during that time? Oh, wow. Or any lessons, any big takeaways? A mystery hunt puzzle is a very particular kind of 
puzzle. It's often very complicated. It has a lot of, I want to say, moving parts, sometimes literally moving parts, and sometimes just a lot of stuff on the paper that you have to digest and figure out how to process. And I have found over the years that taking 20 minutes or half an hour, if you need it, just to make a spreadsheet or doing all the research in advance and not even worrying about what you're going to do with these answers and just getting all the information together, preparing to solve as opposed to leaping in and solving winds up saving a lot of time down the road. So sometimes there's a lot of grunt work just to prepare to solve this complicated puzzle. And you can try to skip that, but you might regret it. <laughs> That's also my advice for people who are new to the mystery hunt and want to participate. My advice is to not try to solve the puzzle. My advice is to try and figure out how you can be helpful to your team in collecting and organizing information mm -hmm. and then learn from them as they solve because there's this extra layer called an extraction that is excessively unintuitive to people who have not <laughs> done it before. Right. And if you can be supporting multiple solves in your first mystery hunt, you're doing great. And then in your second one, if you can get one extraction, you are killing it. And then from there, you can start to feel a little bit of freedom and you can start to learn more. But I would say you really have to crawl before you can walk that is absolutely true. Some of the puzzles have hundreds of clues, cryptic clues maybe, or just standard crossword clues, or maybe some kind of wacky clue that you don't know what you're looking at. But once somebody explains it, oh, you got to take three letters out of each word. Oh, I can do that. Once it's explained, then anybody can jump in and help out. And then it's all hands on deck and you get as many of the answers as you can. And indeed, if you are a newbie, it is probably going to be somebody more experienced that gets the final answer. I loved how you said prepping is really the most important part. I actually recently started doing that with cooking. I used to be a fly by the seat of the pants, chop as you go. And only recently, you know why? Because I started getting HelloFresh, sponsor us. They're good about telling you to prep all of the ingredients first. And I was just amazed at how much smoother <laughs> the whole cooking operation went when I'm not trying to chop in the middle of the recipe, right? <laughs> it is a very useful skill in general to just break it down into steps and say, all right, how do I do this? And, and not just try to leap to the finish line. Yeah. Years ago, I ran a puzzle hunt at a local high school. And when I was scoping out the school, I saw that the fourth floor of it was the science wing, and it was amorphous classrooms with no walls. There was no classrooms. It was just a bunch of areas that bled into each other. I don't know how on earth they use these things as classrooms when you can hear other people in other areas, but it looked awesome. And so I made this maze of words that sent you from blackboard to blackboard in each of the eight areas. And when I ran the hunt, it was an absolute mob scene of students running around trying to find the correct word on the correct blackboard. It was insanity. But over in one corner, sitting at a few desks, were these three girls, sophomores. They had walked from blackboard to blackboard. They had written down all the words on each blackboard and boxed them off. This is blackboard one. This is blackboard two. This is blackboard three. And they sat down and solved the puzzle in about 10 minutes. It was the most magnificent example of the prep work I'm talking about that I'd ever seen. <laughs> just, they just cut right through the madness, and they were the first to solve that puzzle. It was wonderful. These are my kind of kids. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You are also the writer of The Puzzling World of Winston Breen, which is a trilogy. And it is a book series that feels a little bit like if Encyclopedia Brown and a puzzle book had a child. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was a huge fan of Encyclopedia Brown. Me too. As a kid, my favorite series. And <laughs> I actually, I bought this book for my nine-year-old niece. But what was the inspiration and intent behind this series? The inspiration came from a different book that is a classic in the puzzle 
fiction for kids genre, and that is The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. Ah, my other favorite book. (laughs) I still don't understand how I managed to miss this book when I was a kid. This book came out when I was the exact right age for it. It revolves around a gigantic puzzle, and I was a gigantic puzzle head even from that age. And I had never heard of this book until I was an adult in my 30s or late 20s. I'm going to be honest with you. I just learned about it right this second. I don't know how I missed this. Wait, David, you have never heard of the Westing game? No. <gasps> well, it's a classic. It won the Newbery Award, I think, in 76 or 77. And it's about all these people who live in an apartment building. They've all been dragged into this apartment building or tricked into this apartment building and then served up this crazy Fakakta puzzle that they all have to team up to, to solve. <laughs> A will. There's a will. So there's an inheritance at stake here. At the bottom of it, I have been murdered by one of you. And there's a whole mystery. Right. I haven't read it in a long time, so the details escape me. But there's a big puzzle in there. When my puzzle friends learned that I had not read this book, they were like, my God, you've got to read this book. And I'm like, "Okay, I'm going to order it tomorrow. I promise. And I read the book. It was promoted to me as a mystery with puzzles in it. And it's not quite that. It's a mystery with one overarching puzzle in it. And I read it and I enjoyed it and I recognized it as a great book, but it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be going in. It was not a mystery with a bunch of little puzzles in it. And I thought I could write a mystery with a bunch of little puzzles in it. And once that seed was planted, it grew pretty quick. I wanted to write the sort of book that if I had seen it in a school library when I was 12 years old, I would have just gone crazy. And I wanted to write this book for the younger me's out there, the next generation of puzzle heads, and maybe convert some people to puzzle headness as well. And here's another example of me jumping into something without having any idea what I was doing. And you know, it took me five years to write this book because I just I kept losing the way. I didn't understand what was going to happen next in the book. I was completely wrong about who my own bad guy was. Just a lot of things went wrong. But eventually, I made it to the finish line, and uh, I was able to sell to a publisher, ultimately. And uh, it became one of a trilogy. The two other books are The Potato Chip Puzzles and The Puzzler's Mansion. Only the first book's still in print, though, unfortunately. But you can find the other ones out there. And it was a wonderful time in my life. I thought that the highlight of having written a book would be going to a bookstore and look, there it is on the bookshelf. I did it. Yay me. I did not know that I would get to go all around the country and talk about puzzles to tens of thousands of kids. (laughs) That was fun. Every state has its state reading list, and one book or another got on those lists, and I would always get invited to those schools, and I would go talk about puzzles and creative thinking, and then give the kids puzzles in the second half of the presentation, little tiny wordplay puzzles, and they would, I know it, I know it. Only the people who are standing should answer this puzzle. Only the contestants who are playing the puzzle should should be able to answer it. Impossible. Everybody has to raise their hand. I know the answer to this one. I know the answer to this one. They, they, they could not possibly keep their mouths shut when they needed to keep their mouths shut, which was wonderful and a lot of fun. That's fantastic. I've noticed that many of your projects, Puzzle Snacks and Winston Breen, are clearly targeted at raising the quality level of word puzzles for really younger, newer, or maybe just people like me, time-conscious solvers. How do you approach serving this wider range of audience? It's all in the vocabulary one uses. So many times I'm filling a Puzzle Snacks grid, and there is a beautiful too hard a word to use for puzzle snacks. And I just don't use it. It's all about the vocabulary. I want to keep the vocabulary to use the metaphor of New York Times difficulty scale, the easiest puzzles on a Monday, the hardest puzzles on a Saturday. I don't want puzzle snacks getting over a Wednesday at most and probably a Tuesday. That doesn't mean I can't use interesting words or phrases because there's tons of interesting words and phrases out there but they have to be accessible. They have to be known by 
ninety percent of the people who are going to be looking at this, and the the rest of them they can get it from the crossing letters. That makes sense. Yeah, that that's the big thing. You got to it's it's working with the words. That sounds not dissimilar to escape room design, where you're trying to make it accessible. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, given your background in non-narrative centric puzzles, what do you value in escape rooms? Because I know you do play them. I value the elegant puzzles. I love a good set these days. I was there for the first generation of escape rooms where it was just a desk and a bookcase and 50 padlocks. I remember those days. (laughs) So when I go in, I want to see something special at this point. I want to see some innovation. I want to see a puzzle using elements that I have not seen before. And I don't mean it needs to be a harder than usual puzzle. It could be elegant and accessible, but simply creative in a new way. That's what gets me. That That's what makes it memorable for me. I feel that. You created a puzzle game that doesn't have an answer called Spaghetti. Oh. Can you explain what this is? I don't know if I can, but let okay. me try. <laughs> so when we were talking before about the mystery hunt, I said that a round consists of a, some number of puzzles. Let's call them feeder puzzles because their answers will feed into the meta puzzle. And uh, once you solve the, the meta puzzle, you are done with that round. Over the years on my team, Palindrome, I have found that the people in Palindrome and, and puzzle people in general are very good at finding patterns in words that were not meant to be there. Perhaps the most famous story in Mystery Hunt lore is Be Noisy. Do you know Be Noisy? Have you heard of this? No. I will tell you the Be Noisy story. Back in, I want to say 2000 or so, where there was a hunt based on the game Monopoly. The whole hunt was a giant Monopoly game. And you were collecting hotels. And when we are studying a list of words on palindrome, we tend to write them very carefully on the blackboard or put them in a spreadsheet in a monospaced font. Because if there's something reading down a column or reading on the diagonal, you want to be able to see it. So when you say that, just to paint a picture for people, this is a font where the letters are all the same size. So if you write out five words that are all five letters, regardless of whether you're using an I or an M, they take up the same amount of space and they'll look like a perfect grid. Exactly. Because we're well used to having hidden messages in a list of answers that we have generated. So we wrote this on the board. And a teammate of mine saw on the diagonal, B-E-N-O-I-S-Y. Now, this message, be noisy, did not use the last answer in the list, which was weird and probably therefore wrong, but we were stuck and we didn't know what else to do. And maybe this is something. I don't know. So we called up Game Control and they answered the phone and a room full of people just yelled. Ah! And they said, uh, hello. <laughs> they had no idea why we were screaming at them. <laughs> and then a little while later, a second team <laughs> called and also screamed at them because they also found... <laughs> And eventually they figured out why this was happening. Uh, it was it was a, a, it was a complete accidental red herring. <laughs> and it's indicative of our ability to see a pattern in these words. In the game of spaghetti, I present anybody who wants to play it with a bunch of random words. These words are not a puzzle in any way, shape, or form. I chose them at random from a dictionary. And I say, go solve it anyway. (laughs) Find the answer to this random bunch of words. 
I give you five words and I allow you to add a sixth word of your own choosing if, if you wish. So you have six words. They are completely nonsense. And yet, inevitably, somebody in the mystery hunt community, somebody in the puzzle community finds an incredibly elegant solution that takes you to an answer. Sometimes I wonder whether I chose these randomly or whether I I subliminally chose words that have a pattern. There was one time that somebody saw that each word had a single duplicated letter. It was an isogram except for one letter. An isogram, in an isogrammatic word, every letter is different. In these words, it was an isogram except for one letter that was the same. And these letters did not spell anything, but the letter that followed the second letter, when you read those down or possibly anagrammed them, it spelled a word. And it's like, man, how did you find that? It's just amazing to me. People have applied Morse code to the vowels or the consonants. People have applied the periodic table of elements. They've taken element symbols out and rearranged them to spell something. I got to be honest, Eric, I was going through some of the puzzles in Winston Bream with my niece yesterday when I went to go borrow the book. And in one of the puzzles, I was like, this has got to be the way you solve it. You know, there is a there is an actual English word hidden in each one of these last names. Right. And I was like, I went through and I was like, can you underline? And she was like, oh, you're right. And she underlined the English word in like some nonsense sounding last names. And I went to go look at the solution. It had nothing to do with the names <laughs> at all. It was on jerseys and there were uh, numbers. Yeah underneath and then you were supposed to take the numbers and index those into the alphabet and it was like something to do with that and it wasn't the solution i had found at all which was very clear all of it was like which is the odd one out and i was like all of them have an english word in it except for this one (laughs) you got accidentally spaghettied exactly (laughs) that is the least successful puzzle in that book and if i had another whack at that book i'd probably change that This is not the first time that somebody has told me they solved the puzzle in a completely different way, (laughs) which is not supposed to be how it works. One last question for you. You're a member of the National Puzzlers League, also known as NPL. Mm -hmm. This was founded in 1883. It's the world's oldest puzzle organization. And members, when they gather, do not use their real names. They use their noms. I'm curious what your nom is and what it means, because I couldn't find it anywhere online. My nom is Story. When I first joined the NPL in the late 90s, my nom was Storyteller, because I fancied myself an anecdotalist or something like that. It it was pretty pretentious. And eventually, I just I cut it down to Story. And then a few years after that, I actually wrote books, and it became even more appropriate. So yeah, my nom is Story and has been for a long time. Love that it's a self-fulfilling nom. (laughs) Yeah. What's the best way for people to follow your work or connect with you online? By far, the best way to see my work online is to subscribe to Puzzle Snacks at puzzlesnacks.com. Or if you don't want to do that, there's at least a free puzzle there. So you can get a taste of what we've been talking about. If you want to dive into some past projects of mine, or uh, just see some other stuff I've done, ericberlin.com has, first of all, announcements of anything new that I've got cooking. And also the puzzles page is just a pretty comprehensive look at things I've done over the past couple of decades. That will about do it. We will have links to all of that in the show notes. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a joy to have you share your enthusiasm for the puzzling world with us. It was my pleasure. And thank you once again for inviting me here. Thrilled to have you. And everybody, seriously, if you haven't done Puzzle Snacks, check out the new books, Puzzle Snack Bonanza, Puzzle Snack Carnival. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them on the Room Escape Artist Holiday Gift Guide, which you should definitely be checking out. But definitely get these books, solve these puzzles. You will have a great time. Thank you so much, Eric. My pleasure. Thank you. 
The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Teresa Piazza with support by Lisa Spira, Matthew Stein, Andrew Reynolds, and Michael Anderson. We're edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media, music by Ryan Elder, logo by Janine Proct, and all of this is brought to you by RoomEscapeArtists.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. You made it to the end of the episode. I'm guessing that you had a good time because otherwise you would have bailed. How about you go and take that good time straight over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Help other people find what we're doing. It really helps us out. And think about who you just helped out by helping them find a podcast that they are really going to enjoy. Go do it. Do it now. Thank you. Well, folks, it is that time. You know exactly the one I'm talking about. It's the one where the desperate content creator tells you, please, please join our Patreon, please. I know you hear it from everybody, but it means so much to us. The amount of time and energy and money that we put into producing shows like this to the degree that we produce them and all of the other things that we're doing, it's just takes a lot and our patrons every single one of them matters at every single level so if you have the money available and it's not going to be a hardship for you please consider backing us on patreon and if it is going to be a hardship please don't and backing us at the five dollar level gets you access to the ria discord and it also gets you our bonus after show the show goes on for like another 40 to 50 minutes usually a lot of times we have the guests joining us i mean that's that's longer than that cup of coffee will last you at the $15 level, you also get access to our Spoilers Club. Here, we take deep dives into iconic, well-known escape rooms, and we're joined by the creators who come in and gives us exclusive behind-the-scenes, director's cut-style commentary. This is some of my favorite content to produce because I love talking about escape rooms in full. You can learn more at patreon.com slash roomescapeartist link and details in the show notes we'd like to thank our highest level patrons panic room escapism olivier escape jonathan driscoll breakout games derek tam joshua rosenfeld byron delmonico keystone escape games scott olson paula swan rex miller and the ministry of peculiarities thank you for your ongoing support the worst escape room puzzle was in Salt Lake City. This was fairly early on in the escape room craze where you still had a lot of people who were getting into it as a money grab and didn't really know what they were doing. And even some of the solvers did not know what they were doing. For example, if you knew now that an escape room had 0% solving rate, you probably would not do it. But we were a team of heavy hitters. We were at an NPL convention. We had some serious puzzle heads in our group, and there was 12 of us. We're like, we can take on the world. And so we went to do this, this escape room, and we did not solve it. We did okay, but we definitely didn't get to the end. One of the puzzles took the form of a kind of a complicated math equation. It was on a laminated card. It was a bunch of variables that you had to divide and add together and multiply and some are in parentheses and so forth. And they gave you presumably a, a four digit code that would enter into one of the padlocks. And all around the room, little pieces of framed artworks consisting of a single letter duplicated attractively many times, like in a spiral shape or something like that. So we needed a Q. There's a picture of some number of Qs elegantly designed. Let's count the number of Qs. We plug that number into the Q on the equation. Easy. I mean, it's straightforward. It was a lot of grunt work. We had to look for the letters. We had to count the letters accurately. We had to plug it in. We had to do the math and it never worked. It never once worked. We just couldn't get something that we could plug into the padlock and make it work. We're like, damn, what happened? And time eventually ran out. And the game master came in to explain some of the things that we missed and asked if we had any questions. And we're like, what's with this equation? We worked it at it, we worked at it. We never got a correct answer. And she said, ah, well, you see that picture of the dogs on the wall? There was a picture with four dogs on the wall. <laughs> 
she said dogs begins with D. So you had to add four more D's to your D total. Oh my God. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, there were other pictures on the wall of other things, but you didn't need to take those and add any more letters to anything, only the dogs. Why? <laughs> I have no idea to this day why. I wish when she had taken our team photograph that she had taken it at the exact moment that what she was saying occurred to us. I wish that would have been our, our team photo, just the expressions on our face as we grasped this. My soul would have left my body. 